Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Spring 2013 College of Optical Sciences Colloquium Series. Uh, my name is Scott Tayo and I'm uh, the Colloquium Chair, Colloquium Committee Chair, and I'm also the instructor for the students in Opti 595A. Got a couple of announcements for the class, so you guys have to, in the room will have to bear with me. Um, as most of you know, we have a one credit hour course called Current Topics in Optics, which is related to the Colloquium Series where the students um, watch the lectures and do a writing assignment based on that. Uh, the syllabus, for those of you who are in the course, the syllabus is posted on the D2L site and your assignments are due in the D2L site, so you can go in and take a look at that. If you have any questions, uh, you can get in touch with me. One thing that you may not uh, have seen before that we instituted last semester is that students, in addition to attending the colloquia, are also expected to attend at least one dissertation defense and write a report on a dissertation defense. I figured you can't be much more current topics in optics than a, than a PhD dissertation. So. Um, so that's it for the class. If any of the students have any questions, just drop me an email. And we actually have several distance learning students um, that are taking it. The, the lectures will be posted on the secure distance learning site later on, same day. So your reports, unlike in years past, are due the same time as the in-class students' reports. We have a very exciting semester planned. We've actually got everything filled up. Um, we managed to make Dean Koch's budget stretch as far as we could with a good combination of local folks and out-of-town folks, folks coming in from overseas when they're already in the country. Um, and then pinch hitters like Stanley, we actually um, had somebody scheduled today from Intel to talk, but he uh, asked to be moved later in the term. So we'll hear from him in April, and Stanley stepped in and uh, agreed to fill in this space, which is always difficult to fill, the January 24th slot. Um, uh, one quick announcement, so everybody remembers. Cindy wanted me to remind you that there's no food or drink allowed in this room. <laughs> so make sure that you don't leave it behind when you leave. <clears throat> okay, uh, today's colloquium speaker is our own Stanley Powell. Stanley is an associate professor in the College of Optical Sciences here. Um, he received his Bachelor of Science in E in Material Sciences from Berkeley and his uh, a Master's and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Stanford. Um, before joining us here in the College of Optical Sciences, he was a member of the technical staff for seven years at Bell Labs Lucent Technologies in Murray Hill and um, uh, is responsible for many research and product development projects for microfabrication, MEMS, optical subsystem, and optical instrumentation. Uh, he's also worked in the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, and the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco. Um, IBM in Austin, Texas, and the National Semiconductor in, National Semi Semiconductor in Santa Clara. Um, Dr. Powell is the author of over 60 peer-reviewed journals. Uh, he teaches a couple of classes for us here. We know him very well, so Stanley, without further ado, uh, okay. he's going to be talking to us today about micro devices and optics for applications in sensing, imaging, and energy conversion. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction, Scott. I think last time when I gave the colloquium, it was uh, when I interviewed for the job. <laughs> so it's, this is a uh, um, good opportunity for, for me to give you an update on what we did in my group for the last couple of years. So today I'd like to talk about um, several, several things we did. Um, miniaturized chemical sensors, uh, bio-inspired micro-optics and imaging, and then uh, energy conversion. So this uh, doesn't cover everything we did, but it covers all the exciting research that we did here. Um, so the first part, miniaturized chemical sensor. Uh, this project has been uh, funded by DAPA since 2003. Uh, we're very fortunate to have gone through all phases, uh, phase one to four, and now we're funded by DITRA on that. The goal of this project is to develop a uh, chemical sensor, portable uh, chemical sensor on a chip. And there are essentially two ways to do that. Uh, one way is to build an uh, ion trap mass spectrometer. And the way it works is uh, you measure a histogram of uh, mass over um, charge, essentially, of the unknown molecule you want to detect. And then you have a count on what, what molecule. So by knowing what the mass of the molecule is, you identify the, the chemical. Another way of doing it is to use uh, chemical absorption. Um, so you start with a surface, and you put some uh, materials on the surface such that it selectively binds uh, the chemical that you want to detect. Uh, example of uh, chemical you can, molecules that you can put on the surface are, are antibody, or, and, and the molecule that will be bind is antigen. And you can detect uh, the binding event u using um, optics, uh, evanescent wave spectroscopy, or uh, you can also detect it uh, electronically. Uh, for example, if this is the gate of a 
transistor, you can measure the IV characteristic of the transistor and determine uh, what, whatever you want, uh, the, the concentration of molecule that is binded on the surface. So we do both type of research, but today I'm going to talk about uh, our work in uh, ion trap. So what is an ion trap? An ion trap consists of a um, set of three electrodes. So it has a top electrode, a bottom electrode, and a ring electrode. And inside this ion trap has a quadruple potential. So this is the equation for the quadruple potential. Uh, it's a function of position and also uh, frequency. And the way it works is uh, uh, the typical ion trap is, uh, has the size of, let's say, a uh, bottle, um, this bottle here. And it has an uh, electrode that is shaped uh, as a hyperbola. So inside this hyperbolic electrode is uh, essentially a quadrupole potential. And if you put a particle inside this uh, quadrupole potential, uh, basically you can describe the trajectory of the particle using the Maffei equations. Um, and there are two types of solution associated with the Maffei equations. There is a stable solution and unstable solution. And the stable solution essentially looks something like this. The particle, um, the charge particle, move in a um, trajectory, and, and then it looks like uh, this. And then there's, of course, unstable solution, and the particle will just, just uh, disappear. So inside this quadruple potential, you can trap charge particle, and depending on the charge, um, and the mass of the particle, uh, they, they have a stable or unstable trajectories. It is, uh, so our goal is to uh, miniaturize uh, this uh, ion trap. And to do that, uh, is, uh, we use a standard microfabrication technique. And it's not easy to fabricate hyperbolic shaped electro. So we need to do something else. It turns out that if you put a uh, cylindrical electrode, that looks something like this. So it consists of a uh, uh, bottom ring, and then a middle ring, and then a top ring. And you define the dimensions of the electrode in such a way that the uh, z, dimensions, um, uh, z dimensions and the radius has uh, a ratio of about 0.897 to 1. In that case, you can, uh, it turns out uh, through simulation, uh, you you can uh, calculate the uh, quadruple potential inside this, uh, this ring. And it turns out that in that particular case, the octopole potential component is zero, and the uh, dodecapole potential is minimized. So you, have a, you maximize the quadruple potential if you choose this dimension. And for uh, those in uh, microfabrication, you can tell right away this structure is much easier to fabricate than the, uh, than the hyperbolic electrode. So, before we miniaturize such a device, it is important to look at the scaling rule associated with the device, whether there's any reason to make it smaller. And by making it smaller, are there any advantages? So there must be a compelling reason you want to do that. So these are the equation that governs the um, ion trap mass spectrometer, or ion trap. And uh, I want to, instead of discussing the equation, I want to show you the result of the, the plot this is a plot showing the trap radius, uh, the radius of the uh, ion trap, as a function of operating pressure. So by decreasing the size of the ion trap, um, it is possible, uh, at least theoretically, to operate the ion trap at a much higher pressure. So it goes as a mean free path of the, uh, of the uh, ions. So as you decrease the size, the mean free path goes down, the operating pressure goes up. So for those of you who are in um, the field of mass spectrometry, uh, most all mass spectrometers require extremely high vacuum. They have a roughing pump, turbo pump. They operate in uh, uh, pressure below uh, 10 to minus 4, 10, 10 to minus 6 torr. So it requires a lot of energy to do that. So the one advantage of shrinking the ion trap is that potentially you can, um, you can operate the uh, mass spec at a much higher pressure in such a way that you do not need to use uh, the turbo pump. Um, or, of course, you have to compensate the uh, trapping potential by increasing the frequency. So you also have to increase the frequency in order to uh, to be able to trap the ions. And this is just a list of a different kind of pump and the pressure in which they operate at. And the holy grail of this research is, of course, to completely get rid of the pump. 
So it turns out that if you make a trap that has a dimensions of about 100 nanometers, uh, you can operate, at least in theory, to um, that um, at atmospheric sort of pressure, so you can uh, get rid of the pump. So now you can have, uh, do mass spectrometry at a much higher pressure than uh, ever been done before. So, so that's basically the motivation. So uh, the mass spectrometer has three components to it. It has um, the ionization component, which convert um, neutral molecule into ionized molecule. And then it has a um, ion trap, which uh, trap the ions. And then it has a detector, which detect the ions as it's ejected from the ion trap. So the way it works is uh, you have a molecule coming in, and it uh, get ionized. It get trapped into the quadruple potential. And you can ramp up the voltage of the quadruple potential. And as you ramp up the voltage, the kinetic energy of the ions increases. And at a certain point, uh, the trajectory of the ion becomes unstable, and they be eject into um, the detector. So, and in fact, the, um, what's happening is that the, usually the lower mass overcharged ion tend to be ejected first, followed by the heavier mass overcharged ion. And if you build up the uh, detector or the count as a function of time um, a, in a right way, you can build up a histogram uh, of the unknown sample inside the um, gas that you want to detect. So, and our goal is, of course, to, to be able to do this on the chip and also to operate it at a uh, high pressure so, so that we don't need a uh, turbo pump, uh, vacuum pump. Um, and and that's, that's basically the motivation. So the first, uh, one of the problem, we, the way we divide the problem up is we divide the problem into three components, the ionization part, the ion trap part, and of course the detector part. The ionization part uh, is done by uh, using miniaturized electrode. So it turns out if you put two ring electrode together uh, at a dimensions of about one micron, and if you apply um, you know, one volt across this electrode, you'll generate a pretty high electric field of the order of a megavolt per meter. And, and this type of electric field is enough to, uh, to ionize uh, um, uh, essentially neutral molecules. So this is the um, schematic showing the uh, fabrication process. You start out with uh, silicon or insulator wafers, lithography, on the, and then etch, and then flip over and do lithography and etch. And this is the result um, of the device that is fabricated at the NanoFab in uh, ASU, um, consisting of two electrodes. So when you apply the two electrodes, a voltage across two electrode, you generate a very high electric field between the electrode. And um, when gas, uh, neutral gas, uh, goes from one side of electrode to the other side of electrode, so when you apply a, let's say, a pressure, a uh, pressure difference between the two, you get a gas flow. You can generate ions. So um, this is uh, the setup that we use, uh, the chip uh, that was fabricated. If, and these are some of the results that is done um, with collaboration with uh, uh, Bill Whitten and Mike Ramsey at Oak Ridge and uh, at uh, North Carolina. And so when we apply the voltage across the electrode, we can detect um, ions, basically, um, and in helium atmosphere. And when we increase the voltage, uh, we, we detect more ions. So, so this, is, uh, this process actually worked pretty well, and these are some of the IV characteristics of the device, and also the, um, um, the, for different type of gas. So, um, so, these are, so they, they work pretty good at different pressure. So the next component is, of course, the ion trap. So how do you, um, so here are uh, the similar design of the ion trap. Um, this is a 40 micron size uh, ion trap. So normally, uh, if you look at the ion trap dimensions in a uh, mass spec, it's about a centimeter. So this is a thousand times smaller than any existing uh, ion trap, basically. And we have not only one of them, but we have uh, an array of them. Um, and these are microfabricated, actually. In, it was microfabricated in Bell Lab. And um, consists of uh, three electrodes, so the top ring electrode, middle ring electrode, and bottom ring electrode. And uh, we actually got this to work. Um, 
And so this is a setup. We have the chip, and then we have an ionization source, a few emitters, and then we have a detector, channeltron. And this is the, one of the first uh, results that we um, have showing that uh, we actually can do, uh, well, pretty low resolution mass spec, but uh, the first time ever, ever, anybody has done um, um, basically mass spectrometry metry using a uh, microfabricated trip uh, in this type of dimension. So, so that's, um, this is a uh, simulation showing that um, we, we did our experiment in uh, pretty high vacuum, but uh, at least in simulation, uh, we show that um, for higher pressure, 76 torr, um, it is possible at least to uh, trap uh, some of these ions. Uh, if, um, so you've got an ion coming in from the top, and it goes in uh, and, and become decelerated and trapped uh, inside this uh, array of ion traps. So, uh, and we have uh, since then uh, demonstrated uh, even small ion traps. So we go from 40 micron to 10 micron and uh, demonstrate trapping of uh, xenon ion, um, atomic ions, and also uh, molecular ion, DMMP, which is a surrogate for, um, for explosive uh, uh, that is uh, used uh, for testing a mass spectrum, uh, mass spec. So, so that's a pretty good uh, result. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided that uh, in making um, cylindrical geometry, ion trap is pretty difficult. We have multi-layers. Uh, so we come up with a way to uh, build a simpler version of the ion trap. These are called a planar ion trap, which consists of only a uh, set of ring electrode on a plane. You can see right away that um, this type of um, device tends to be a lot more simpler to, to fabricate. So you just need one, one level of lithography and etch, and, and then you're done. And in cases like this, you have a quadruple potential on the tip um, on, on the uh, ring electrode. So here are the quadruple potential. And we actually fabricated uh, a few of these devices and uh, demonstrate that they actually work uh, as a mass spectrometer. So these are some of the mass spectrum that was done uh, for helium uh, and also for DMMP. So, uh, and these are operated uh, at a uh, different frequency um, and pressures. So they, they work pretty well. And so since uh, we are uh, optical science, so the next step is, of course, integrate this ion trap with uh, optics. So, um, so the way we did it uh, is to uh, put waveguide on this planar ion trap. So this is the fabrication process. Uh, we essentially have a single ring electrode, and we have a single uh, SU-8 uh, waveguide on top of it. And, and then uh, we, we can put uh, splitters. Uh, interferometers and um, or just a simple single waveguide and and then um, and this is what it looks like um, this is uh, showing you that uh, is trapping a uh, charged particle single tra charged particle I think is a um, one micron uh, diamond charged diamond particle and you have a uh, optical fiber coming in um, with the laser and uh, light and goes into the fiber uh, the waveguide, and then it's scattered off the um, charge particle, trapped charge particle, and it's scattered off, and we detect the output of that. And, and uh, this is showing you that um, we can trap uh, single ions and uh, multiple ions. Um, basically, when you have multiple ions, because they are charged, they, they tend to repel each other, and they form a lattice. And, um, and this is, um, so we have light coming in one side, scattered off the ions, and then uh, couple to the other side, and if you put a detector on the other side of the um, of the output of the waveguide, what you will see is a modulation of uh, intensity of the light, as shown here. So um, as the particle move on the on the orbit, um, you got a scatter light from the charged particle, and this scatter light is uh, coupled into the waveguide and, and then detect later on, and this a Fourier transform of this uh, gives you the um, Secular frequency of the charged particle, and gives you, uh, and we can go back and back calculate the mass over charge of the of the particle. So, uh, so this is uh, useful information. And we also try to um, integrate the ion trap with um, a camera. So, uh, 
And the way we did it is uh, we used a two-ring electrode, and we put a, uh, a small CMOS camera um, on, on, the, on the inside the ring electrode, an image on the ion trap. So the way it works is um, you have a quadruple potential at the tip of the ring, and, um, and that can be used to, to trap um, particle. And uh, this is the geometry associated with the, uh, with the um, ring electrode. And, and then uh, we can, uh, the camera is about 5.2 5 millimeters in diameters. And, and this is a picture showing when the particle is trapped. Uh, this is done using a, uh, a fast camera uh, at 1,000 frames per second, so you can actually see the motion of the trap particle. And, um, moving back and forth um, in, in the quadruple potential. So, so this is just to show you the, uh, it's actually a boroscope, and, and then um, this is the trap. And, and we use this to actually uh, pick up and transport charged particle. Uh, you can actually put char uh, trap the particle and then move it, and uh, you can face, face the uh, charge in one direction, in the top direction, bottom direction, and and so forth, and look through the boroscope, and the particle is still trapped inside this uh, this um, trap. So, and and this is a movie showing actually how, um, as you uh, change the voltage inside the ion trap, you can you first start out with an, um, maybe 40 different charge particle in a charge lattice, and as you change the voltage, in this case you actually ramp down the voltage, we can go from 40 charge particle to a single particle. Uh, essentially, we're ejecting the particle one by one. And then um, at a certain voltage, um, uh, going from uh, 750 to 250 volt, at a fixed frequency of 60 hertz, um, we can um, um, go from uh, an array of uh, charged particle to a single particle. So essentially, that's how uh, an ion trap mass spectrometer works. You trap a bunch of gas. And then you eject them one by one, and you, de you detect when it comes out. And then you get a mass histogram of, of the gas, uh, a known gas, uh, that you're trying to measure. So, and so that's uh, conclude the first part of my talk. Um, are there any questions before I move on <laughs> to the second part? <laughs> so did you, is that now functioning, miniaturized? You know, uh, yes, it's functioning individually, yes. So. The ionizer functions by itself. The um, trap functions by itself. It turns out the key component that is not functioning is the detector, uh, the charge detector, because um, the, it's very difficult to, to f make an uh, atmospheric pressure charge detector. Most charge detectors operate at very high, pressure, uh, very high vacuum because they, they essentially uh, have gain. They uh, consist of... Uh, material that when you have one electron, one ion goes in and you generate hundreds and thousands of uh, electrons and then it's uh, like a photomultiplier tube. So photomultiplier tube doesn't work at atmospheric pressure. They uh, operate at high pressure. Uh, uh, they operate at high vacuum. So, so that's sort of uh, what we're working on right now, try to figure out how we can create a charge detector that operates at high pressure. So, yes. How small we can make, we'll make it down to one micron, but uh, we did not manage to get those traps to work. I, I can show you pictures of one micron ion trap. The outputs there that you showed, your, your diagram, so it's, that wasn't with it. That works up to about 10 micron. Yeah. Why does it break down? Why, why, does it why doesn't it work at one micron? Uh, many reasons. I mean, it has to has a very high frequency. So uh, as you scale up the frequency, we run into impedance matching problem because essentially what you have here is a uh, is a very big capacitor, um, and and it's very difficult to impedance match uh, something with very high capacitance uh, at high frequency. So, are there any other questions? I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna lie. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, bio-inspired micro-optics and imaging. And that has to uh, do with, um, that started with the Murray program where we have to essentially study uh, small animals. 
and try to uh, figure out uh, how the optics work in small animals, and and then try to uh, come up with novel photonics uh, structures and devices to take advantage of what we learn. So uh, what I want to show you is that uh, we can learn something from um, small animal and we can apply it to uh, polarization imaging, uh, who you know, Scott and Russell are well expert in this area. And so we start out with the beetles, uh, the dung beetle, uh, scarab beetle. And it turns out the exoskeleton of the dung beetle looks something like this. It has some hexagonal uh, periodic structures and that looks like cholesteric liquid crystal. And it turns out that this uh, beetle exoskeleton act like a circular polarizers also. So if you shine it with, uh, with circular polarized light um, in this way, you will see a very bright green uh, iridescent uh, reflection. If you shine it with the opposite polarization, circular polarization, um, it's black. So essentially it's a circular polarizers. So we want to build uh, structures um, that looks like that, uh, that um, mimic uh, that, and which uh, hopefully, uh, well, by using uh, liquid crystal. Um, and um, so why is this useful? Um, it turns out that um, certain, uh, or those, our eye cannot see uh, polarization. Um, we can see different colors, but uh, other animals can see polarization. For example, the mantis shrimp. We look at the uh, re uh, receptors uh, of uh, along here. They, they can see uh, different polarizations, so they communicate to each other by wiggling their antenna, uh, and, um, and you can see that they are, you know, in one polarization you can see it, in the other you can't. And this is um, cuttlefish, and they can also see polarization. Um, their, their skin has um, display, po essentially like an LCD, uh, and they communicate with each other by uh, changing colors on their skin. So. So how do we uh, create um, uh, small polarizers based on this idea? So the way we do it is to use uh, 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 polarized uh, optical lithography. So uh, for those of you uh, who might not be familiar with that, so we start out with a UV lamp uh, and a polarizers and a mask uh, so that uh, after the filtering from the polarizers, you get a polarized light and we have this material uh, called the uh, linear photopolarizable polymers, LPP. And it has a unique property that if you expose it with polarized light, uh, you will create uh, microscopic structures that, that align with the polarization of the light. So uh, it looks something like this. So if you rotate the polarizers and do another exposure, uh, then you create a different orientation in a different area. So. Uh, so we use this as a substrate for our liquid crystal polymer, and then we dope the uh, liquid crystal polymer with dye. Uh, so from that, we can create uh, polarizers. So this is a video showing, uh, this is actually the PhD work of Graham Meyer, who just graduated uh, about six months ago. Um, so we spin coat this material, and as the solvent evaporate, you got all these liquid crystal uh, molecule, they will automatically align and frozen to the substrate. So now if you look through the polarizers, uh, you will see the pattern uh, that is originally generated using the uh, UV uh, polarized uh, lithography. So, and you can see actually a distinct color change. So you got this uh, liquid material and, and as the solvent evaporate, um, all of a sudden, you have a color change and all the liquid crystal molecule align. Uh, there's almost like a phase transition. And we didn't really study this very uh, carefully, but it's, it's pretty unique. And it only works uh, when you use certain type of solvent and certain type of liquid crystal. And it took us more than a year to figure that out, <laughs> a long time. So, and, um, so it's not a simple task. And so we use, um, we got some material. Uh, some of these, uh, well, most, most of these materials are available uh, commercially. Uh, these, um, uh, some of them are from Olek. So we can spin coat this material at different spin speed to get different thickness and retardance, essentially. And uh, this material is trans trans transmissive 
from UV to infrared, so it's uh, pretty uh, pretty good for for as a polarizer's material. And the first thing we did is to construct a bunch of uh, uh, wave plate and polarizers, and uh, to mimic the uh, the uh, beetle exoskeleton. And this is shown here. And the second thing we did is uh, try different dye material. So we doped the liquid crystal material with dye, right? And the dye, uh, the, we use dichroic dye. Dichroic dye is essentially a very long uh, molecule that has a unique dipole moment. So by putting that in the liquid crystal polymer, they will align with the liquid crystal. And, the, and then what that means is that they will tend to absorb only light polarized in one direction. And uh, we use uh, different color dye. And by mixing different color dye, you can have almost any color you want uh, for the polarizers. And, and then um, we also um, try to build a great polarizers. So uh, by going through a uh, study um, uh, of a ratio of uh, 10 blue and um, 10 yellow and uh, 2 purple, uh, it turns out that we can uh, create a, uh, a, a mixture of dye that has a very small deviation across the visible spectrum, uh, meaning that is essentially a gray polarizers. And uh, so after this optimization, we figure out that by using a different concentration of dye, we can create a uh, gray polarizers that will work uh, through the uh, entire uh, visible spectrum. We also look at the resolution of this dye. Uh, we can pattern it down to um, usually about five micron or so which we believe is limited by the opti optical lithography uh, upstairs and uh, in the ECE clean room. So we also look at the um, um, extinction ratio for different dye concentration. And uh, it goes exponentially with increasing dye concentration. But uh, at, at a certain point, the, uh, the dye tend to segregate. So we, have, uh, we can't increase the uh, concentration anymore. We can also create uh, circular polarizers or elliptical polarizers by using multi-layer. So uh, we have uh, linear polarizers uh, and a wave plate. Uh, these can act like uh, circular polarizers. And then you look at the extinction ratio and, the, um, and the, essentially the feature size um, of uh, this kind of uh, polarizers. So essentially, we have developed a way um, to um, microscopically uh, control the alignment of molecules um, in any dimensions. Um, normally in lithography, you control the presence or absence of molecule. And this is uh, an, another way, uh, a powerful way. You, you not only control the presence or absence of molecule, you control the alignment and directions of the alignment of the molecule. So, so we dope the um, in the polarizer case, we dope it with an absorbing molecule. So we decided our next experiment is we want to dope it with um, uh, fluorescent molecules. So, and we want to see whether it's possible to create a, a polarized emission from, uh, from this. So we pick uh, several uh, um, fluorescent dye material. These are actually um, uh, synthesized, uh, um, well, uh, you, you can't buy this um, dye. We have to synthesize it in our lab. Uh, and fortunately, we have a collaborator in Japan who, who does that. Um, and so these are three different dye. And they're all dichroic dye, so they are pretty, they're all long molecule, which can be um, co put inside the liquid crystal and essentially make them align in one direction. These are the uh, photoluminescent and photoluminescent excitation of the molecule. This is uh, measured in the chemistry lab um, and uh, for the different dye. Um, and these are the um, results showing that uh, indeed they actually photoluminescence uh, in the whatever direction we want is this polarized photoluminescence. And it's also a very efficient uh, photoluminescent. It turns out that uh, this type of dye is have a very high quantum efficiency. Um, and um, so we have a Shown here is a red um, dye and also the green dye uh, emitting and polarized light. So this is a movie showing that um, uh, when we excite the uh, pan wafers with uh, UV light 
and we rotate the polarizers and we see polarized green emission uh, coming out uh, from, from this aligned uh, molecule inside a liquid crystal film. So, so we have a way to essentially control the, um, the polarization of the emission of this molecule. Okay, so just, just one slide. It turns out that this molecule that we've been using um, has very unique self-assemble self property. Uh, we discovered that by accident, and we basically put in a tube, and, and they form very long, high aspect ratio structures uh, of the order of 10 to the 4 up to 10 to the 1, uh, single crystal uh, structures. And uh, these structures uh, also emit polarized light, it turns out. And they also form a very long waveguide structure. So uh, we did a bunch of study uh, and simulations on these uh, structures. Uh, they have a, is a, essentially a tube, a hexagonal uh, tube. Um, and they, they form very interesting uh, multi-mode waveguiding. Um, um, and this was recently published. So, so, that's, so now that we have this uh, material, uh, polarizer material, which uh, we can... Um, make uh, with high resolution, uh, what, do, what can we do with that? So, so the next thing we do is, uh, of course, uh, we want to build a polarizer array on it and then put it on a, put it on a camera, on a CCD, and build a polarization camera out of it. So uh, we choose the Kodak 2020 sensor. This is a very popular sensor. This is the one that is used by um, the Mars uh, lander also. It has a 7.4 by 7.4 micron pixel, and um, and basically um, it has two megapixel. Um, and essentially, what we did is uh, uh, we create an array of uh, micropolarizers of uh, different orientation in, um, using uh, uh, polarized optical lithography uh, and and the uh, liquid crystal material that we developed. And these are some of the result. Um, uh, taken from uh, Dr. Chipman's lab. We want to thank him for allowing us to use his equipment for free. I know he charged everybody else a lot of money. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, uh, and these are some of the uh, results on, on the uh, micropolarizer work. And, and, and then uh, once we have a good, good uh, array, we, uh, we bond it. Uh, we actually got a local company, 4D Technology, help us uh, to to bond these uh, polarizers on the CCD array, and um, and and then we use a camera body uh, made by a Santa Barbara instrument, um, and and then we just plug this on this, and then we we calibrate the camera and start taking pictures. Um, we we use a Nikon adapter so we can use different Nikon lens of different uh, focal length. Uh, we look at the extension ratio for different F number. At low F number, they work pretty well because um, all the rays comes in normal direction. Uh, we try to, well, we do a calibrations uh, using a uh, polarized light source and look at the uh, accuracies of the camera. Uh, we find that the accuracies for the degree of linear polarization is approximately 5.3 degrees uh, percent, 5.3 percent at uh, 580 nanometers. And then we take some pictures. Here's the um, uh, object we take pictures. is essentially a um, uh, you know, uh, chopper. chopper, yeah. And we put uh, different polarizers uh, on uh, the choppers, um, oriented in different directions. And then you, you measure the uh, S0, S1, and S2. And, uh, and we're actually very lucky because uh, one of Scott Tyler's students um, did his thesis on this uh, uh, on interpolation, on an analysis, on the data of, uh, of generating uh, good images. So we, we use this uh, essentially his code um, on, uh, on interpolating and uh, processing our data. So we're very lucky in this. We got uh, two pretty good uh, collab collaborators. He didn't charge you either. And he didn't charge me either. <laughs> so so we, we're pretty good. And, um, and then when you spin the uh, um, chopper, you, you, you get an image like that, S, S0, S1, and S2. Um, and this is uh, another image. So, um, And then, um, of course, if you can take image, you can also take uh, 
movies. So this is a time lapse movies uh, showing a car on the Cherry Garage across the street uh, in the morning, and you can see the sun uh, go across and the polarization changes. Um, you can have the uh, degree, the angle, the degree of linear polarization, um, and uh, S1 and S2 um, for the. Uh, so so this is. Uh, so this is just for measuring S0, S1, and S2, so the linear polarization component. Um, and for our next second camera, uh, we decided that uh, we want to, uh, for one of the linear polarizers, uh, we replace it with a circular polarizers. So we can also see circular polarization of light. And that allow us to measure uh, S3, uh, essentially, uh, which cannot be measured by the previous camera. So uh, this is the array. Um, the polarizers array. Um, this is uh, the um, circular orientation and linear die attenuation of the circular polarizers array measured using uh, Chipman's uh, setup. And, and then we go, go to 4D technology and they help us bond another camera and, and then we have another camera and uh, we, we take some test images again and this time we can see uh, S3 uh, and um, degree of uh, circular polarization. So we can now measure the full Stokes, uh, all four components of the Stokes vector uh, in the visible spectrum. And of course, uh, we go back uh, and measure the beetle, um, and we see uh, some degree of circular polarization associated with the beetle. We start off with the beetle, we end up with the beetle, everything goes in circle, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then that's that's it uh, for this part of the talk. Any questions? Sam? Yes? When you were seeing the accuracy on your polarization measurements, was that really variability? Had you calibrated every pixel, or was that? Uh, every pixel is calibrated, so we have the molar matrix of every single pixel, yeah. So that really is an accuracy? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, because if you hadn't calibrated every pixel individually, yes. then it really would have been a uniformity measure. Yes, uh, it's every pixel has a molar matrix, and in fact, it takes almost a day on our slow computer to process the images. And, uh, and for the movies, it takes, I don't know how many days, uh, it takes quite a while, so. Any other questions before I go to the last part of my talk? Okay, so um, I've been thinking and working on this problem uh, for many years, and um, this problem has to do with uh, energy convers conversion. So we are blessed with a lot of solar energy. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, what we need is uh, not solar energy. We need gas and electricity. So we need some way to convert what we have to what we need. And uh, we, need it to do, we need to do that uh, rapidly and with very high conversion efficiency. So, so that's essentially the problem in energy conversion. Um, so how, how do we do this? Uh, so one thing we tried is uh, we're looking into solar pump semiconductor lasers. Uh, this is done by uh, Stanley Johnson. Um, and the way, if you look at conventional solar pump lasers, uh, they are very inefficient, you know, less than 1% efficiency. They are terrible. Um, uh, so we thought that maybe we can do better than that, and did we did. Um, and the way we did it is we start up with a photovoltaic cell, a triple junction photovoltaic cell, and then we hook it up uh, to uh, semiconductor lasers. So uh, we bought some uh, triple junction photovoltaic cell. It has maybe 25% energy conversion efficiency. And we bought some uh, semiconductor lasers. They have about... 41, 42 percent energy conversion efficiencies. And then we hook them up, uh, and then we put it on the roof, and then we look at the efficiencies. And it turns out that they, we can reach uh, more than 10 percent energy conversion efficiency. So um, we can convert uh, incoherent uh, solar radiation to coherent uh, monochromatic uh, laser light with uh, more than 10 percent energy efficiency. That's better than anybody has done. Um, before, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why this is um, this is interesting. Uh, theoretically, we can do much better than that. Of course, uh, we we don't have the state of the art uh, photovoltaic cell or the state of the art uh, semiconductor lasers. 
Uh, so we tried different semiconductor lasers uh, from 445 to 1550, um, uh, different wavelength, different powers, goes from one watt to five watts, um, depending on um, uh, the lasers. The key, compo the key part in, in connecting the photovoltaic cell to the semiconductor lasers is, of course, impedance matching uh, what comes out of the uh, um, photovoltaic cell to the uh, load to, to your semiconductor lasers. So the way we do it is uh, we stack the photo, uh, photovoltaic cell in series and in parallel uh, and try to get the right um, impedance matching for the, uh, for the um, semiconductor lasers. So uh, why does conventional, semiconductor, uh, conventional solar lasers so inefficient? Uh, one other reason is because of uh, uh, spect spectral uh, utilization. So if you want a 445 lasers, uh, you can only use uh, all the wavelength in the solar spectrum that is shorter than 445. Uh, and then you throw away everything else. Um, and then uh, that's not a very good utilization of your spectrum. Uh, if we use a triple junction solar cell, we, we essentially utilize all the spectrum. And the way it works is um, instead of adding up, um, having a single electron with the right energy, we have three electron. Um, I guess they, they add up in series. You can add up the voltage in series. And that electron, once it goes into the, well, once it goes through all the free diodes, will have enough energy to, um, to drive the um, semiconductor lasers and give you the, the uh, blue photon that you need. So in this way, we, we can have much higher efficient utilization of the uh, solar spectrum. And this is just some data, a seven-day data for the uh, 976 uh, solar pump semiconductor lasers, uh, giving you the solar radiance, the uh, laser output power, uh, the PV array temperature, and the system efficiency, which sits uh, closely to about 10%. And uh, transient, uh, once in a while, the, there's a cloud that covers the sun. And then the solar cell tends to uh, cool down. And then, um, and then the clouds disappear, and then the sun comes back down. And then you have a spike. Um, in efficiency, the spike can go up to 13% uh, efficiency. So, uh, so this this uh, dev type device tends to work better at low temperature, and we don't have any uh, active cooling system. We don't have any active uh, concentration system, uh, and um, so it's actually a very simple uh, simple uh, setup. And this is uh, one day data for six different solar pump semiconductor lasers. Um, going from 445 uh, blue lasers, 635 red lasers, 808, 915, 976, uh, 15, uh, 50 infrared lasers. So um, essentially, this, uh, this idea works for any semiconductor lasers. And uh, because of the way we impedance match thing, it's difficult to match um, the uh, gallium nitride lasers. So we get only about 3% energy efficiency. But this is still. Uh, much better than any existing solar pump, or solar pump lasers uh, in, in this color, I think. So uh, this is, um, so now that we have the lasers, uh, what can we do with the output of the lasers? Um, so the idea is, uh, we, this is in collaboration with uh, Joe Kulo, um, and uh, he's an expert in algae. And we had the idea that we want to build uh, we want to use semiconductor lasers to grow algae. So people have been using um, lamps, LEDs, to grow uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, all kinds of plants. But uh, nobody has used lasers to uh, grow la algae. So, so we want to see whether it will work or not. So why would we want to do that? Um, well, first of all, we can, you can have very high power lasers. And you can also have a very high efficient laser. So in terms of energy conversion, uh, it's, it's very efficient compared to, let's say, the fluorescent lamp, which is very inefficient. And uh, if you look at the absorption of uh, the, the coral field uh, inside the algae, it looks something like this. And, and there are certain peaks associated with the absorption. Um, and this is the uh, spectrum of the coal cathode lamp. And based on the absorptions of the uh, coral field, we choose several wavelengths of uh, laser light, a blue light and two red light, um, to try to grow algae. 
And so the setup is pretty simple. You have a semiconductor lasers coming in, integrating spear, and um, we put a bottle of algae inside this integrating spear, and uh, we monitor the temperature and the uh, energy that's coming out with or without the algae, so we know exactly how much energy is going into the algae as a function of time, and um, and then we grow the algae for a certain cycle, and then we compare the different uh, light source and see if they work. So the result is shown here. Uh, the good news is that the algae um, they like uh, radiation. They like uh, they grow in uh, lasers. Um, and they, they don't seem to care whether the light comes from a lamp or an LED or the sun or lasers. And what we found is that we normalized the uh, cell count versus the call field uh, for final initial. Um, for the case of white light for 655 lasers, 680 lasers, 655 plus 474 lasers, 680 plus 474 nanometers lasers, we find that uh, by using lasers we can do better than uh, just using the white light source in terms of uh, yield. And this is uh, showing the uh, cell count per core field per light energy absorbed. And we found that uh, similarly, um, essentially, um, by using lasers, uh, we can optically match the absorption uh, of the core field better. And, and we can get a, a much better photosynthesis uh, conversion in the algae, and um, that's, that's essentially the result that we found. And so now we have a way to go from solar energy to laser, laser to algae. So <laughs> although it's not, it's, a, it's not a very efficient way, but uh, it's, it's, it's at least one way of doing it. Um, so this is just to summarize. We have successful, successfully grow uh, algae using lasers, and by combining the lasers, um, the blue and the red lasers, uh, we can uh, do much better than just uh, using a white light control. So, We also try to uh, create hydrogen using a uh, uh, chip. So the way we did it is um, we, have, uh, we, we built a set of an array of uh, micro reactors. The micro reactor are essentially a um, small chemical reactor that can be fabricated on the chip. And this is the design. Um, we went through several design of the reactors. Uh, this is the third generation. Essentially, what it consists of is just a chamber, reaction chamber with electrode. And you have um, water going in on one side of electrode, electrolyte going in on one side of electrode. And you apply voltage on the electrode. And what comes out is uh, hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other side. So essentially, is a, it, it's a... Um, Micro uh, electrolyzer, um, and we did some three dimensional uh, frame lab simulation just for our design, just to look at the flow of the um, of the gas and uh, liquid. Uh, this work was done by Linan Zhang, um, and and that's um, is the, the reactor is designed that is separate the oxygen from the hydrogen. That's, that's the key part. You need to separate the oxygen from the hydrogen. Otherwise, it, it doesn't work. So, uh, so we uh, did a lot of testing on these uh, devices with water, uh, uh, electrolyte uh, going in and um, electrolyte and gas coming out as we apply the voltage across the electrode. And um, this is the setup. Uh, and we measure the current and flow rate and the generation of hydrogen uh, for different voltages, and uh, we get an uh, efficiency of about 40%, which is not very good. Uh, and that's, um, but, but it's the first time anybody has done uh, this type of work, so at least the flow rate and the catalyst is not optimized. So, so that, that's it. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge the people who did the work, uh, collaborators, uh, and the people, uh, the agency who pay for the work. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stanley. Other questions? I have one question. Awesome.